Hey everybody, it's Bruce here. Welcome to my channel, Traveling with Bruce. I hope you enjoy the upcoming video. If you like it, consider giving me a thumbs up. If you really like it, become a subscriber. If you like my channel as a, as a whole, check out my Patreon page and consider supporting me there too. Okay, let's go to the video right now. Hey everybody, how you doing? It's Bruce here with Traveling with Bruce. Today's video is a memory of mine regarding the country of Germany, the city of Berlin, and a number of other unique things about Germany from, from my perspective. Uh, to give you folks a bit of a background here, um, and sorry if I'm rambling on because a lot of memories are flooding back to me right now. Um, it's 2017, almost 2018 now. Uh, I've just turned 62 years old. Uh, I was born in Canada in 1955. And my father, in 1959, when I was uh, four and a half, five years old, was a member of the Canadian Armed Forces. Um, he had immigrated into Canada in 1952 uh, from Germany. Uh, he'd grown up in Lithuania, and uh, during the Second World War, uh, he was a young, young guy, a teenager. When the war was over, he was 15 and a half, 16 years old. And uh, he was able to immigrate to Canada uh, seven years after the war was over at the age of 22. Um, came to Sudbury, Ontario, was a miner, a, a mining nickel, and uh, did that for a couple of years for the money. Then figured out that if he returned to his roots, which was a musician, he could uh, make more money playing music. And the amazing part about it was he could join the Canadian Army as a musician and uh, he ended up in the uh, RCD, uh, the Royal uh, Dragoons, in the military band. And uh, he was a top-notch uh, musician and uh, was good enough to join and, and uh, uh, made more money playing music in the army with benefits than he was uh, as a minor in, in, uh, in Sudbury. Unbelievable. Anyway, he joined the army, I believe it was about 56 or so, uh, 57, and by 59 they found out on uh, New Year's Eve, night, I guess it was New Year's Eve, 1958, getting ready for 59, they found out, surprise, surprise, our entire brigade is being transferred to Germany, to Zost. And it's a two-year deal from 59 to 61. And uh, not only are the, uh, the members of the armed forces going, but the families as well. And uh, here are my mom and dad, both coming over from Germany. My, my mother joined my father a year after he got here. And uh, they had two kids, myself and my sister, and um, they were being transferred back to Germany, where my parents came from, uh, uh, with the army, all paid by the army. And they were to be paid in Canadian dollars in Germany, where you could get four German marks for each Canadian dollar, uh, which made you a very wealthy person in Germany, because the Germans were still struggling to get by in the late 50s, uh, after the war effort and all the reparations and that type of thing. Now, uh, 1959 comes along, and uh, we went across the Atlantic on, on, uh, on a ship, and, um, and uh, we ended up in Zost, Germany, living in a, uh, in a house, and I bet you my father and my mother were maybe um, 100 kilometers away from where they had emigrated from to come to Canada. So what a what a turnaround. They were able to uh, visit with their relatives again, their brothers and sisters, uh, their aunts and uncles, and their friends um, returning from Canada where they had not seen, my mother had not seen her mother and father uh, for um, six years, six, seven years. And her parents had never met me, uh, their grandchildren. Uh, so this was a gift from heaven to, to be able to do this. And here I am as a five-year-old, oblivious, oblivious to what's really going on. The reason we're in Germany is because my father's in the army and under the NATO commitments, uh, Canada was uh, uh, bringing in divisions of troops to potentially guard against the red invasion from the Soviet Union uh, Germany was divided into East Germany and West Germany. We're in West Germany. We are 25 kilometers, is, if that, 40 kilometers away from the front, <laughs> from the East German front. I, as a child, knew nothing, couldn't have cared less. 
Uh, my parents were completely comfortable with the entire situation because they knew that the Americans were there, the Brits were there, the French were there, uh, and the Soviets were in no mood to have another world war <laughs> over Germany. That had been settled a long time ago. However, um, within a year or so, guess what happens? We we're supposed to be there for two years and then come back to Canada in 61. And... Uh, Sure enough, in, in 61, what happens? The, um, the Soviet Union, uh, the East Germans, put up the Berlin Wall. And this changed everything. Uh, my parents uh, had talked to me about Germany over the years, the Second World War over the years, and here was another chapter in the continuing saga of East versus West. The Berlin Wall goes up overnight, unannounced, and uh, all forces of the allies all allied forces are on worldwide alert overnight and my father is confined to base and uh, the whole mood of germany changes instantly uh, all of us uh, army brats and uh, uh, our families everything changed it, it became quite somber quite uh, tense and uh, a lot of people were worried about what might happen in the next few weeks We'd already survived the Cuban Missile Crisis uh, uh, earlier. Now this, the, the Berlin Wall going up, and the tanks were being brought out, and uh, uh, along with artillery and everything else, and oh my goodness, uh, were we going to have World War III on our hands, and were we going to be on the front lines? Um, we wondered if we were going to be bugged out at a moment's notice by the Canadian Army, and they were going to get the wives and children out of there, and sent us back to maybe England and eventually back to Canada. Everything was up in the air. Um, if you weren't there, you have no idea. You couldn't know. And I have not seen a Hollywood movie ever uh, depict the tension and the uh, stress that families of, uh, of uh, Army personnel suffered or were going through when this type of crisis happened. I've seen documentary after documentary about the Berlin Wall and the Cuban Missile Crisis and the uh, East-West tensions between the Soviets and the Americans and all East Germany, West Germany, all that stuff. Tens of, tens of, not hundreds of documentaries have been done, movies have been done, but uh, this story uh, was uh, unique to us and how we felt on the ground. Of course, my parents felt uh, terrible for uh, all the relatives, brothers and sisters who would be stuck there if war did break out again. Because uh, we'd get out, my sister and I and my mother, we'd get out most likely, unless it was a surprise launch attack of some kind and everybody was killed in a nuclear annihilation. But uh, all of our relatives would be stuck in West Germany and uh, they'd become instant refugees And if it got bad. I mean, it was just, there was so much tension, you have no idea. Um, if you're under uh well if you're my age or younger uh, first of all you probably just don't know um if you're 40 years of age uh, or younger you haven't got a clue uh, what this was about what about what it was like the soviet union as it was disintegrated back in the reagan era in the george bush area era and so uh you just don't know the tension that surrounded this whole thing but uh, east germany west germany oh my god what a tension filled situation now to connect this to Berlin, because uh, I want to connect this story to Berlin, that's where the wall went up. Berlin is a city that's located in what was East Germany. Um, the Soviets captured Berlin at the end of the Second World War. The Americans could not get there first. The French couldn't get there. The Brits couldn't get there. Um, the the uh, uh, Canadians, all the Allies had swept through Italy had swept through uh, France, Belgium, the Netherlands, and they were headed east. And they had entered Germany along the Rhine and were coming into uh, what was at this point now in the 60s, West Germany. They had liberated a lot of German territory, but the Russians were coming from the east. And they had revenge on their mind. And it went right to the heart of German power, which was Berlin. They wanted to be the country to topple the Berlin government, to get Hitler, and uh, shut that thing down. And uh, they concentrated their moves predominantly towards Berlin. 
And in the meantime, the Allies, they were trying to salvage as much of Western Europe as humanly possible because going forward, the worry was as soon as the war is over, the two sides, the Russian side, the American side, which were theoretically allies in the Second World War, would instantly become adversaries. As soon as the war is over, we aren't pals anymore, and lines will be drawn in Europe. And Churchill for the United Kingdom, uh, the Gaulle for France, and uh, the Canadian Prime Minister Roosevelt for the United States, uh, and eventually Truman, they knew they had to get as much of the territory of Europe under Western Allied control as possible. Otherwise, it could be lost to the Soviet Union. And history bore it out because Poland and Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Romania, Ukraine, all of these countries that the Germans had invaded were all retaken by the Russians, and the Russians didn't give it up. They didn't withdraw their troops back to the Soviet Union. They stayed, and they created puppet communist states all over the place, and eventually they created East Germany. So when the war was over, the Allies did get to Berlin eventually, but the Americans, the French, the Brits, the Canadians, they got uh, to the western half of Berlin uh, inside what became East Germany. So Berlin, the city of Berlin, was an island in the middle of East Germany, separated by about 120, 150 kilometers of distance to the West Germany border. And the city of Berlin itself was now carved up into zones, occupation zones, and they were controlled by the Russians, the U.S., the French, the Brits. And uh, uh, for a number of years, from 1945 until 1960-61, for you know, 15 years, Berlin operated as an island city and uh, Germans could come and go, uh, West Germans could come and go into West Berlin, East Germans could come and go uh, into East Berlin, and they could actually cross into each side of Berlin. Uh, there were a lot of East Germans that worked in West Germany, or West Berlin, I should say, and they would just walk over or bicycle over or take the subway or a bus and go to work, and then at night back to East Berlin and live there. But as time went on, it became obvious that East Germany was an economic wasteland. The opportunities for doctors, lawyers, engineers, uh, nurses, uh, anyone with skills was greatly diminished in the East. You could work in West Berlin and make much more money, get paid in Deutschmarks, and then your Deutschmark was much more valuable than the East German mark. And what began to happen was East Germans began to leave East Germany and move into West Berlin or West Germany if they could get out across that border. Well, the East German government and the Soviet Union had to put a stop to the brain drain, the talent drain. And um, it finally came to a head in, in 1960-61 when overnight the uh, East German government put up the wall. And so going forward in time, what I didn't realize as a five, six, seven-year-old <laughs> was the significance of all this because in 60, uh, 60, 61, when the wall went up, we were supposed to get ready to go back to Canada. The two-year hitch for my dad was up from 59 to 61. All of a sudden, that was canceled. We had to stay another year, and it was decided after that that uh, deployments would last three years at a time so that the next group of soldiers and families that would come into Germany into NATO bases in 61, they would stay until 64, and then from 64 to 67 and so on. And we ended up leaving Germany in 62. So in 1962, my father and mother, my sister and I, we took a boat back to Canada and uh, returned back to, to Canada and uh, left our relatives behind. But in 62, things had settled down greatly. Uh, the wall was, was now up and tensions had been lessened. Uh, armed forces weren't on alert anymore. But going forward, I heard all my life from age 7, 8, 9, 10, all the way through my teenage years, 20s and 30s, when my parents and their friends got together, who were, of course, other Europeans who went through the war, we heard stories about the Soviets. We heard stories about the Germans. We heard stories about the Polish. And then, of course, we would hear stories about East Germany versus West Germany because we, too, had relatives that were stuck in the East. Even after the war, Certain members of, of my family, my father's family, my mother's family, were not 
convinced by the Western European friends and relatives to get the hell out of Eastern Europe. Uh, they thought, no, everything will be fine. It'll all settle down and it'll all eventually be reunited and we'll all be fine again. Little did all of us know, and particularly those in the East, that it wouldn't be until 1989 that there would be reunification. Most of the relatives had passed away of old age by that point or were quite elderly. And certainly their offspring had never known the West uh, like, of course, we did. Anyway, so I had heard all of these stories about uh, the East and the West and, and, and Berlin. And so when the opportunity presented itself in 2008 for me to go to Berlin for the first time, I went and I took my daughter with me, who was uh, just turning 20 at the time, and uh, I got to see Berlin in person for the very first time in 2008. I was able to return again in 2015 for three visits in one year, and I was able to uh, see Berlin with my wife uh, firsthand for a much longer period of time, and I so enjoyed it, and I was so fascinated and curious about what part of Berlin was East Berlin, what part of Berlin was West Berlin, and I wanted to see the difference through my own eyes for myself, having heard all of the stories through my from, from my relatives and my parents all those years ago. Unfortunately, my father passed away in 2000, and he, never, he and I never got to talk about this uh, trip. He had long been gone when I finally got to go, but uh, I remembered a lot of his uh, stories and words uh, of, of, of the times and, the, and how things had changed and what had happened. And, of course, from his perspective as a member of the Canadian Army now, uh, you know, talk about full circle. He was a refugee in the Second World War, and he was a member of the Canadian Armed Forces in uh, 59, 60, 61, 62. Unbelievable. So that is a bit of a memory situation for me in Berlin and, and Germany as a whole. I, I really didn't realize until I grew up. Uh, and even in the last few years, I really, it didn't hit me how um, linked uh, I am to so much of what has happened in Germany over all those years through the Second World War and, and thereafter. And so when I was able to visit Berlin um, three times in 2015, and the last time I was in Berlin on my own for two and a half weeks, I had no children to worry about. I didn't have to worry about my wife's wants, needs, and desires. I was in an apartment. I had a bike. I had a transit pass. And I had Berlin all to myself for two and a half weeks to discover the city and its history. What a gift this was. None of my friends that I've uh, grown up with and have known in adult life have ever had this situation happen to them where they could for two and a half weeks be alone in a foreign city and just look around all you want. I know friends of mine who had the wonderful one or two week vacations uh, in Europe and they would see two or three countries and two or three or four or five cities. But to be in one and this particular city, what a treat this was. And to see the sites of uh, East Berlin like Potsdamer Platz and the Berlin Wall, what's left of it, and uh, the, uh, the former East Berlin apartment blocks, Stalin Ali, uh, Karl Marx Ali, uh, the, uh, the big TV tower was such a, a unique thing for me to see. Uh, they call that the Fernja term TV tower. I just call it the big tower. It's 110 stories tall, the tallest structure in, uh, in Germany. Uh, I use it as, a, as an observation point. I knew where I was in the city when I could find that the tower. Places like Trepp Tower Park, where the Soviet War Memorial is, 80,000 Soviet soldiers died taking Berlin and tens of thousands of their bodies are there. It's kind of like the Arlington National Cemetery uh, for the Russians on foreign soil, however. Uh, to have seen Museum Island, uh, again, that was in East Berlin after the war was over. Today, it's beautiful. The Brandenburg Gate, uh, where Reagan uh, made his famous speech, tear down this wall. Uh, I saw the old um, West Germany City Hall, where President Kennedy uh, said, I'm, uh, Ich bin ein Berliner. Uh, there's a plaque there to that speech. He died five months after making that speech in Dallas. That was really something to see that, and how the Germans revere him uh, and Reagan. The Reichstag building, uh, where the Parliament of uh, Germany is held today. Um, I got to see it uh, as well. Uh, 
um, the various parks, the Spray River, and of course, then I got to experience modern Berlin uh, with the Sony Center and uh, all the changes that have been done. Um, I was amazed from just 2008 until 2015, the changes in the um, the uh, Berlin Wall area through uh, Berlin that had been made in those seven years. Uh, the build-out is unbelievable. Cranes everywhere, construction cranes, just everywhere in Berlin. Uh, it's a dynamic place. If you ever, ever think of uh, taking a holiday and you just don't know where to go and you want to see something unique, get over to Berlin, Germany and check this city out. Whether you uh, have German background or not, whether you know anything about the Second World War or not, the Cold War or not, just go. It will be a revelation for you to see such an incredible place with such unbelievable history. Uh, we're talking history from the 1100s and forward. Uh, I'm only talking to you today about history from the 1950s until 2015. Uh, Berlin is so much older than that, has so much more to show you. The museums are endless boat tours everywhere it's perfect for cycling you just rent a bike and go the transit system is world class uh, no north american city can hold a candle to the uh, transportation systems in germany and particularly berlin no north american city would ever be able to spend the kind of money that germany spends on their systems it's it's unbelievable infrastructure you want to see infrastructure? Go to Berlin, Germany and see how it's done and then tell your politician back home to get off their butts and do it right because, boy, do the Germans know what they're doing. Phenomenal place, phenomenal memories. Um, I can't recommend it more highly. I can't wait to go back. Um, people say to me, well, Bruce, you've been to Berlin three, four times. Why don't you see some other German cities? And I'm going, yeah, I'd love to, but I haven't seen all of Berlin yet. <laughs> But I will, I will see Munich, I will see Frankfurt, I will see other cities in more detail when I get the chance. But Berlin is a place you want to go on your own or with your, your significant other or with your kids. You can certainly do that as well. The area around Berlin is amazing. Um, and then, of course, the electric train system that the Germans have, uh, the high-speed trains. Wow, what a treat that is to get one of, or ride in one of those systems. Anyway, this has gone on long enough. We're at 22, 23 minutes. I got to get off. Thanks for listening to this long memory uh, uh, deal about Berlin. If you like my video, I don't know if you would, but if you like it, give me a thumbs up. If you like my channel, subscribe, tell your friends, and uh, I'll see you next time on the next story that I have for you on Traveling with Bruce. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.